Taking stock of your setting, like when and where you will see your students for coding, is one of the crucial first steps uh, when starting coding curriculum with your students. And this is because how and where you choose to go about teaching will really help inform, again, what platform you choose, the tools you incorporate, and how you structure your lessons. So I'm gonna walk through six different settings or use cases that you might choose to explore, you might choose to use coding in. And this is to show you that no matter where you're teaching or how much time you have for coding with students each week or month or year, uh, you can be successful, you can make it work. And if you want more stories from real coding teachers who were either trying it for the first time or were somewhat new to the field, we have some really great case studies on our website and I'll ask Bree to drop a link as well so you can reference some some stories from real teachers so they can tell you how it's going as opposed to just hearing the use cases from me. So the first setting is direct instruction. The setting here is likely a classroom and the educator who is utilizing direct instruction, I would say is likely a either a tech specific teacher, perhaps a librarian who oversees tech instruction uh, for a large group of students or a classroom teacher that teaches multiple subjects and has you know, designated computer science time where they're hoping to teach coding in a structured lesson with some sort of you know, targeted outcome, similar to how they teach their other subjects. So how does kids coding look in this setting? I'll just walk through like a, an example session. It could start with a five to 10 minute introduction about the topic for the day. This could be in the form of, of a short video. Perhaps it's a slide deck where you're introducing what today's topic is, perhaps sequence, for example. Then there could be some sort of collaborative activity. Maybe it's a group brainstorm, a think pair share, a KWL chart, a mind map, something that is incorporating some group think uh, related to the topic of the day. Then teachers can transition to tech devices if you have them or unplugged resources if you have those, where students will be making something with code related to the topic in the introduction. And then there's typically some sort of wrap up at the end, maybe it's a debrief discussion, an exit ticket, et cetera. So that's just a quick example of what direct instruction with coding might look like, pretty similar to how we would teach any other subject. And if this is desirable for you, you have the time and the space to make this happen, then you'll want to look for resources that provide a similar level of detailed support. Because again, introducing something new can take some time and there are resources out there that have already done the heavy lifting for you. So I know code.org has some good scripted lessons. At Codable, we also have um, some scripted lesson plans that include you know, a section for a direct instruction and a group activity and the debrief all scripted out. Uh, so those are resources that you can find and follow so you don't have to spend a ton of time planning. The next setting that we'll talk about is coding in centers and in stations. Again, the setting here is likely a classroom, but this could work well with even a large number of students, maybe an after school club or a camp. And I'd say that the type of educator that is employing centers or stations in their classroom is likely a teacher that might want to cover multiple subjects or activities at once, because in a station-based classroom, there's multiple stations, multiple centers where kids are working on different activities or projects. So it's a great option for teachers who want to have multiple activities or cover multiple topics at one time. Or it's also really great for educators who might need or want to give specialized support to a specific group of students or around a certain activity or assignment. And that way the teacher can sit with one group while other groups in the classroom are busy working on other projects. So centers are implemented again by any, any type of teacher can do them in mostly any setting, but I'll walk through what like a potential format could look like for you if you wanted to introduce coding to this setting as well. So it would start with some sort of an introduction about what centers are available today. Perhaps you have 
four math centers and one coding center, and the teacher will be sitting at a certain table to help with a specific math content, um, math activity, and coding is, is out there at one of the other stations. Perhaps as the teacher, you would do a short demo of each center so kids are prepared, they know what to expect, and you'd split the class into small groups, and then you would have some sort of time interval where you're keeping track of structured time and students have a task that they're working to complete or some sort of project, perhaps they don't need to complete it, but they're working on something at each station and when the time is up, they'll move on to the next. And as students rotate, a new group will head over to coding uh, and you could be teaching other content as well. So this is an awesome option if you can't carve out specific coding time, you know you want to incorporate it, but you don't know how you're gonna make it happen on its own. With centers, you can invite students to code as one option while other students in the class are doing another activity like math or writing, etc. And I would say coding activities that work really well in this type of setting are ones that keep kids engaged and motivated. Um, so gamified learning is, is really awesome in this setting. Something that is going to keep the kids engaged so that as the teacher, you can support other students in the class. This means that the program that you're using with coding should also be uh, more child directed and uh, Codable would be one example since it is a game-based platform. Um, we've seen it be really successful in centers where kids can be working on the Codable game and teachers can be doing another center with students and both can exist at the same time. Next up, uh, one that we are likely all familiar with at this stage in 2021, and that is virtual learning. Virtual learning was obviously vital during the 2020 school year. And if you taught students virtually during this time, so online, not in a, in a building or a classroom, I'm sure you've already heard this, but let me just say really quickly, I'm so impressed with the innovation that you all showed. And I saw a positive come out of the chaos of virtual learning, which was that teachers and students had to get a lot more comfortable with online learning tools. I talked to a ton of teachers who were using platforms like Nearpod or Seesaw, which is in this picture, or Google Classroom to connect with students throughout the year and provide online learning opportunities. So even though we hopefully will not go back to a full shutdown situation anytime soon, my guess is that a lot of you will still be utilizing virtual learning environments like Google Classroom or Seesaw in the future, even when you're face-to-face -face in the classroom. In this scenario, for virtual learning, your setting could be a virtual classroom, it could be a face-to-face -face classroom, it could be you know a summer camp or a tutoring center. Um, and virtual learning is awesome because you can offer it to tons of students or a small group or even one-to-one. Uh, -one. What does kids coding look like in this setting? you'll want to pick a coding platform. Let's say you pick Codable and you want to try it, you sign up. Most platforms like Codable will have some sort of login instructions or like a code students will need to enter somewhere, a password. So you'll want to make sure you gather those instructions and then you send it along to students via whatever method you choose. So Google Classroom, Seesaw, etc. And students will open that assignment and complete it. The nature of coding platforms being primarily online would make this a really smooth choice. So if you have younger students or even older students too, there may be a time in your classroom for free play. I know that when I was a teacher, uh, there was time for free play, sometimes following a quiz or during a rainy day recess or when we all needed a little bit of a break. And during this free time, teachers, myself included, would want the activities to still be educational in some manner, but also really fun and exploratory. And coding is a wonderful option for free play. As I mentioned earlier, you'll likely want to find coding activities that are like extra fun. So ones that are game based or open ended so that children can choose what they're working on. It is free play, which means free choice. So you'll want something that children can choose and also something that doesn't require a ton of teacher supports. Again, free play is an example of an open-ended learning environment where you don't want to be getting asked a ton of questions all the time. What might coding look like in this setting? Children working at their own pace, working on challenges or puzzles, like on an iPad or a Chromebook. And project-based learning is great here. I saw that Bree posted a link to one of our blogs about project-based learning. If you have questions about that, 
um, please reach out to me directly. I'm happy to to give any tips. But Codable, for example, has a maze maker creative project where kids can make mazes and then give them to their classmates to play. Uh, so that's like encouraging collaboration and is a lot of choice based learning. So that's one example of of how you can have free play, but also incorporate educational uh, content. Two more settings to go over. The first is Hour of Code. If you don't know what it is, the Hour of Code is a super exciting worldwide event that takes place during Computer Science Week, which is typically the second week of December each year. And the goal of the Hour of Code is to, to, to introduce computer science to as many children as possible. If you want to start coding with students, but you really don't think you have the time or the resources to make it happen earlier in the school year, then setting up a plan to start with an hour of code would be a perfect solution. What does coding look like for the hour of code? Well, it would start with you picking an activity that looks interesting for you and your students. I know that uh, we have a codable page with all of our hour of code activities. There's also some excellent hour of code activities that you can find on the code.org website. They're the ones who host the hour of code. So after you find something that looks interesting, again, it's one hour of time, you gather the necessary materials. Typically, this might just be the tech devices you're going to use, but for some, there might be a worksheet or something else that you want to gather. Your next step would be to like hype it up, get kids excited. It's a really cool event uh, that so many kids participate in at the same time. And then you'll do your hour of code, one hour coding activity, and then you'll see how it went and if your kids loved it, you can start to think about doing more of them throughout the year. The Hour of Code can happen any day. It does not have to be just during December, um, but that is when a lot of different companies and teachers will be providing webinars and trainings and teacher guides and activities because it's Computer Science Education Week. So that's a great time to start. Um, so again, make that plan. If you don't want to incorporate coding throughout the beginning of the school year, the Hour of Code is something really fun to look forward to. And I highly recommend exploring Hour of Code resources um, if that's a good place for you to start. And last but not least is unplugged coding. This could be, the setting could be your classroom. It might be an after school club. Um, maybe you do unplugged coding for homework or an outdoor education project. Basically, unplugged coding includes worksheets like shown above, but it might also include physical hands-on activities that do not require a device or pen or paper. So an example at Codable, we have an unplugged activity in one of our lesson plans where students will pair up and one student will be the programmer, the coder, and one student will act as the robot or the computer. And the programmer will give the robot um, as specific instructions as they can to have them do different movements. And it's a good way to test out if your instructions are clear enough and in the proper order, which again is a huge uh, important factor in coding. So that's one example of an unplugged activity that might not be a, work, a worksheet, but is still reinforcing the coding concepts. Coding in this setting might look like some sort of an introduction, a direct instruction where you're introducing a concept like sequence and giving some sort of short video or um, introductory slide deck. Then you would launch into your unplugged activity. It might be a group activity, a partner activity, um, whatever you wish. And then again, some sort of wrap up at the end. So this will look kind of similar to direct instruction, but coding unplugged can be during brain breaks. It might be like a five minute exit ticket where you do a short unplugged coding worksheet. Uh, so those are just some examples. And there are a lot of resources online. If you Google unplugged coding activities, um, some companies do have structured units that are made up entirely of unplugged lessons. So I know we have this at Codable for schools and code.org has some unplugged lessons as well. Um, there are resources out there if you don't have tech devices and that is something that you're interested in. 